In this video, I will be introducing and performing the sonata in G minor for solo violin by Johann Sebastian Bach. Playing with a Baroque bow and on a violin by Genaro Venatia, made in Naples 1755, I will be using a violin technique and equipment that would have been familiar to Bach. If you would like to see the performance without commentary, please click on the link shown here or in the video description below. As well as my lifelong experience as a Baroque violinist, I am inspired by Joel Lester, David Lettbetter and Jupp Schröder, as well as 18th century writings by Bach and his contemporaries. Bach completed the cycle of solo violin works no later than 1720, the date on the manuscript. He had turned 35 that March and in July buried Maria Barbara, his wife of 12 years. Two of their seven children, Wilhelm Friedemann and Karl Philipp Emanuel Bach, had survived infancy and were nine and six years old, respectively. Normally, one would describe these six pieces as sei a soli, using the plural form of the word. Did Bach actually mean sei solo, literally translated as you are alone? It would certainly describe his unexpected and desperate situation of suddenly having to support a family all alone without his wife. At the same time, it tells the violinist that he or she is alone and bears the full responsibility of the performance. Looking at the autograph, it is clear that Bach was hearing the music as he penned it, and playing from the autograph can have a massive effect on our performance, as well as bringing us closer to Bach's world. For example, musicians of the early 18th century were expected to be familiar with a much wider range of clefs than we use today. The very first page of Wilhelm Friedemann Bach's Klavierbüchlein, which Johann Sebastian gave to his nine-year-old son, teaches us how to read notes in eight different clefs. In the fugue, Bach uses the French violin clef very pragmatically in order to fit the notes on the stave. The Kustos is a guide at the end of the staff to indicate the first note of the next staff and is to be found in all 18th century music, whether printed or autograph. The early 18th century was a period of transition between the old modes and the new major and minor keys. That for the entire G minor sonata, Bach writes only one flat in the key signature indicates that he was thinking in the old fashioned Dorian or D mode. In the Siciliana, the key signature is also incomplete, suggesting the Lydian or F mode. Bach, however, used this to convey a musical message. By carefully writing all the missing accidentals into the score when needed, and in important moments not only once in the bar to apply throughout, but for every affected note, Bach actually gives us a visual aid to interpret the music. These notes with repeated accidentals are sensitive, or indicate an important modulation. Look also how Bach uses separate stemming for the double stops, reflecting this, the 18th century thinking that harmonies arise for the, from the interplay of melodic lines. This influences the way we play chords. Here, he does not change the direction of the stems and the notes sweep from low to high uh, across almost the entire tonal range of the adagio. As with the stems, the beams also suggest the fluid musical shapes Bach had in mind whilst writing, writing down the music. So what sounds did Bach actually have in his mind at the time of composing the Adagio? It seems that the texture of chords separated by flourishes particularly interested him in the years just before 1720. The opening symphonia of the Cantata BW12 Weinenklagen Sorgen Zagen shares with the Adagio a mood of high tragedy. The second movement of Brandenburg I is another good example. These pieces, like the Adagio, all have a very regular harmonic pace underpinning the solo flourishes and are intended to be played with a reasonably steady beat. Bach builds the piece, however, by continually intensifying his musical ideas. 
This compositional style mirrors the techniques of rhetoric that were so revered in the Baroque. Bach's contemporary Johann Mattheson's advice in his famous 1739 publication, Der vollkommenen Kapellmeister, is to follow the clever advice of the orators. Both musical compositions and orations had to state and develop an idea. Neither should bring in unrelated ideas. Both should grab and hold the audience's attention with more exciting forms of the ideas occurring strategically to reawaken any lagging attention. Understanding this is key to understanding how Bach's music works. I hear this adagio as a passionate speech conveying a message of tragic importance supported by a masterfully constructed and meaningful bass line. The Adagio's opening G minor chord is an icon for the entire sonata resonating through all four movements. Bach, the violinist, ingeniously opens his solo violin cycle with the simplest and most characteristic chord a violin can produce. The adagio is the prelude to the fugue. The two movements belong together as a pair, not only because of musical connections, but because of the tradition of this pairing. In Bach's musical world, a fugue's dense musical argument was not simply thrown at an unprepared listener. Composers always set the stage with a prelude. The prelude-fugue pair is much greater in expressive and structural power than either movement by itself. The adagio is basically a prelude built on a figured bass. The harmony is the driving force, not the melody. The melody is like an unfolding rhapsody over a steady, supporting bass. The dominant is reached in bar 8. The second section has the most abrupt harmonic changes and the last section from bar 14, which also happens to be the golden section of the piece, is essentially a transposition and intensification of the opening nine bars. And briefly, three musical devices Bach uses which I find helpful to be aware of when playing the Sadagio. Firstly, the sighing motive. The opening gesture, a descending G minor scale, falls directly into a sighing 4-3 dissonance. The sighing motive is a very poignant feature of this piece. Secondly, we can also find scales hidden within the texture which help with directing phrases towards important cadences or expressive moments. I call these hidden scales. In this piece, the hidden scales are all descending except for the one in bars 17 to 18, which leads to the chord with the highest note in the most wrenching harmony of the piece, the first beat of bar 18. From here, the music within half a bar tumbles to the lowest possible note on the violin and via the pleading Neapolitan sixth chord, finally settles into the coda. And lastly, the juxtaposition of A and A flat. This intensifies as the key changes to C minor, the A flat becoming the hauntingly expressive Neapolitan six in G minor. In fact, this merging of C minor into G minor is central to the structure and expressiveness of not only the adagio, but the sonata as a whole, where C minor plays a very prominent role, more so than the dominant key of D minor, which would normally be the case. With this, Bach sends a clear message as to the character of the sonata as a whole.
this fugue subject is unusual. With its repeated notes and narrow range, it sounds archaic, almost like a 17th century canzona theme. Composed in cut time, the middle of the bar is not a strong beat. The entire subject feels like an upbeat to the second bar, propelling the music ahead. It is also unusually short, emphasising the falling mode of D, C, B flat, a key feature of this piece, the harmony of which forces the fugal answer into the subdominant key of C minor. This is very unusual. Almost every other Bach fugue answers in the dominant. Once again, Bach seems to have gone to extraordinary lengths to ensure the dark tonality of C minor prevails in this piece. The inevitable and unsettling A, A flat juxtaposition intensifies as the movement proceeds. The passage bars 35 to 42 is interesting. It does not appear on an earlier manuscript, and on his final version here we see that Bach gives us no indication on how to play it. He does not suggest an arpeggiated rendition as he did in the similar passage in the D minor chicane, for example. Although many people do arpeggiate this passage, I personally find it more effective not to, because by doing so and effectively playing the passage in 32nd notes, it is impossible to avoid a disappointing letdown of energy when the passage ends and changed to 16th notes in bar 42. Structurally, at this point in the piece, the level of activity should be increasing, not decreasing, in order to maintain the build-up of tension leading to the next major section in bar 55, which, in fact, is the golden section of the piece. provides a powerful harmonic backbone to the whole piece. The principal cadences are, after the initial G minor section, D minor, C minor and B flat major. After these cadences a new section starts and the fugue is presented in a different way. Interestingly, these major cadence or landing points which delineate the form of the piece do not coincide with the very clear textural alternations between causal writing and the passage work in sixteenths. This alternation between two very different textures creates excitement on a different level, invoking a dialogue between soloist and orchestra in the style of a concerto movement. The sixteenth ep no, episodes could be the soloist and the chordal fugal sections, the tutti orchestra sound, for example. The G minor fugue is so long and the subject so brief yet frequent. How can the performance avoid seeming like an interminable series of fugue subject entries? Firstly, we can often find hidden scales that suggest a much longer phrase and help propel the music towards a climax. Secondly, Bach masterfully builds his musical arguments with boundless imagination. Each fugal exposition is more energised and inspired than its predecessors. As well as introducing new material after each cadence, Bach makes the approach to each important cadence increasingly spectacular. And thirdly, he creates tension by increasing chromaticism as the fugue proceeds. Unusually for Bach, no chromatic notes appear at all until bar 7. However, chromaticism slowly but surely enters the fray until the ending, which features a hair-raising double chromatic scale in sixteenths.
Siciliana in warm, relaxed B-flat major is a brief respite from the serious tone of the G minor sonata. Although Bach did compose very serious and meditative music in the style of Siciliana, Ebarmadich, for example, from the Matthew Passion, or the first movement of the C minor violin obbligato sonata, these types of pieces are always in dark, minor keys. The scoring of the Siciliana is like that of a trio. The bass line supports two higher instruments. I imagine a cello and two flutes, for example. The Siciliana falls into three roughly parallel sections, all ending with a strong cadence. Each section develops the musical ideas further, once again using the techniques of rhetoric to increase intensity and hold the audience's attention. The first modulation that occurs in the piece is to the relative minor, G minor. Not as would normally be the case to the dominant. In fact, F major doesn't appear at all in this piece, very unusual, and reflects the serious character of the sonata as a whole, even in the context of this lighter movement. Prominent imperfect cadence in bar 2 inspires two other passages in the third section, both of which feature a long descending scale leading up to the imperfect cadence. Bar 17 and 18 are extra. Bach could have skipped straight to bar 19 from the end of bar 17, but holds us in suspense, making us wait until we finally arrive with relief back to the reassuring welcome of the coda. As violinists of the 21st century, it is inevitable that we compare Bach's Presto with the numerous Moto Perpetuo style compositions of the 19th century. They are, however, conceptually completely different, and this affects the way in which we play them. Paganini's Moto Perpetuo is a typical example of the 19th century model. A fast surface flashily elaborates a much slower, simple melody. Bach, however, uses a myriad of patterns, articulations that create syncopations and other rhythmic complexities in order to keep the audience engaged and, at times, even in suspense. Excitement and ambiguity abound, even in the first three bars. Is the meter 3-8 or 6-16? Neither metric patterning seems strong enough to overwhelm the other. This also happens in bars 9-11. to 25 to 29. As with the other movements of the sonata, Bach's structural strategy is to continually develop the musical ideas. Every musical element that appears in the first half of the movement recurs in the second half intensified. The corresponding arpeggio of the second half not only ascends instead of descending, but races to the highest note of the entire piece. <laughs> corresponding element in the second half is anything but stable. Instead of a two-bar tonic dominant pattern, it is a four-bar pattern with dissonances and a key change. The simple transposition of this passage becomes more complicated when Bach runs out of notes at the bottom register of the violin. Using this to his advantage, however, he creates a new and more technically challenging pattern. Whereas in the first half, this progression is based on a tonic pedal. In the second half, it starts and ends in different keys. 
here, not only are the patterns expanded and interspersed with other figurations, but also the direction of the pattern reverses and there are many seventh chords. And finally, the approach to the final cadence is greatly intensified in the second half. In the first half, the final cadence is approached with a dominant pedal. Here, he uses the more dramatic ever-ascending bass pattern. The long versus short bar lines are an interesting feature of this piece. That Bach used the time signature 3-8 indicates a rather steadier tempo than 6-8. Though the half bar line suggests that he nevertheless wanted the flow. From G minor through B flat major and D minor at the double bar to C minor and returning to D minor. This harmonic sequence parallels that of the first movement adagio and just as the opening chord of the adagio is also quoted in the opening pattern of the presto, the final flourish that completes the sonata is once again the most iconic chord of the violin, G minor. <laughs> 